Keep going. All right, so here's a summary of the problems I'll be talking about today. If you've seen me talk before, you'll know that I love bases for permutation groups. It's what I did in my PhD, so I'm going to start off by talking about those. Then we're going to move on to IBIS groups, which are groups who have all their bases, all of the same size. There's been some interesting developments there um, in the last couple of years. I'm then going to change topic completely and tell you about prime graphs for finite groups. And we're going to finish off with some work I've recently done on extremely primitive groups. Okay, so bases for permutation groups. So throughout this section, I'm going to let G be a permutation group. Now, we say that uh, B is a base for G if it's a subset of omega such that the only permutation that fixes every element of B is a trivial permutation, okay? So in other words, um, the intersection of the pointwise stabilizers here is trivial, okay? Now, if I give you a random permutation group and I give you the set it's acting on and I ask for a base, you could, of course, just give me back the whole set, okay? Because um, we're assuming that we've got a permutation group and so the only element of that group that's going to fix everything is the trivial permutation. Now, that's not very interesting, and for that reason, and for applications of bases that I'll tell you about shortly, we're usually interested in the bases of the small size, um, which we call the base size and denote by this B of G here. Okay? Now, let's look at a couple of examples of base sizes. So, first of all, if I take the symmetric group acting naturally on endpoints, the base size is n minus 1. Why is that? Well, suppose I had a base. Um, that was of size at most n minus 2. That means that I've got at least two points that sit outside my base. So since I've got the symmetric group, I can just take the transposition, swapping those two things, and I'd have a permutation that fixes my thing that was supposed to be at base, but it's not trivial. Okay, so it couldn't have possibly been a base. So we need the base size to be at least n minus 1, and of course, we know that if you fix n minus 1 points, you must fix the final one, and so you must have the trivial permutation. Um, next, if you take the general linear group on a finite dimensional vector space V, then the base size is the dimension of V. This is maybe a little bit less trivial to see, but with a little bit of thought you can work out that if you do have a base, then it has to be a spanning set in your vector space. And so, as we know from first year linear algebra, um, the smallest size of a spanning set is going to be the size of a basis, which is the dimension of V. Now, like some people mentioned uh, when they were talking about their research earlier, I <coughs> too like finite groups, and so unless I tell you otherwise, all the groups I'll tell you about in this talk will be finite. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to assume that my actions are faithful, which means that um, the only element of my group which fixes everything is going to be the identity permutation. Okay? All right, so how big or small can bases uh, be in general? Well, Here's an easy lower bound. The base size um, for a permutation group acting on a set of size n is bounded below by this log of the size of g over log n. Okay? And this is a very easy thing to prove. And since I thought I should have a proof in my talk, here it is. Um, so by definition, we know that the pointwise stabilizer of a base has to be trivial. Okay? And so that implies that every element of your group is determined by how it acts on a base. Okay? Because if you have two distinct elements, say G and H, which act in the same way on a base that you know, then you can compose G with H inverse and achieve something that acts trivially on the base but is non-trivial, which of course we can't have. Right? Now, why do we care about this? Well, it tells us that the size of the group is bounded above by the number of images of a base. Okay? And this argument holds for all bases, so it in particular holds for the smallest one. So that's how we get this, uh, expression, these expressions here. And then you take log of both sides and rearrange, and we get our lower bound here. Okay? So why are bases important? Well, they were first defined by this chap, Charles Sims, in the early 1970s in the context of computational group theory. And at the time, people were very interested in um, starting to use computers to work with permutation groups. 
And as you can imagine, um, as your groups get large or the number of um, elements that you're acting on gets very large, it becomes difficult to store permutation groups efficiently. So this was one of the motivations um, for, for introducing bases. Okay? In particular, you know, if you think about how you might store permutations in a computer, you of course have the naive way, which would be to tell the computer explicitly what a given permutation does to each element of the set. But if your set is very large, that's very inefficient. So it turns out that a base can help you to represent each group element um, much more efficiently. Now I'm going to go into a few more details here. So if I've got a base, okay, I'm going to put it in some order, say b1 up to bk, then I can have this chain of subgroups here. So I start with g, and then at each step I fix a further point of the base, okay, to get my gi's here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the quotient of consecutive terms in this series here, and then I'm going to um, take right coset representatives. Now, it turns out that every element of your group can be written uniquely as a product of right coset representatives there, okay? And so if you need to store uh, your group in a computer, instead of recording um, how each permutation acts on the set, you can just record something about these coset representatives and then tell the computer, okay, these are the coset representatives that you need to multiply together in order to get this group element, okay? And so this technique has been used a lot in computational group theory um, for algorithms to work out things like orbits and stabilizers, membership testing and so on. And on Thursday, you'll hear much more about computational methods um, in group theory, so I look forward to hearing more about that then. Okay, so then you might be thinking, all right, well, I have my favorite permutation group, let me find a base, um, maybe a small base, um, and then I can do this stuff. Unfortunately, Peeva showed in 1993 that almost all subgroups of Sn have base size bounded below by some linear function in the degree um, of your permutation group. Okay, so, you know, in general, for general permutation groups, you're not going to be able to find any non-linear upper bounds for the base size, okay? But being the resilient mathematicians we are, we don't give up looking at these bases, particularly because they're so useful. We instead um, focus on a certain family of groups, which are the primitive groups, okay? Now, we heard a lot of primitive group stuff this morning, but I'm just going to run through the definitions again in case you forgot. So we say that a permutation group is primitive if it's transitive, so I can um, use the group to map from any element of my set to any other element, and if the only partitions of your set preserved by your group are just the partition where you've got one part, that's the whole thing, or you've got the partition where every single set is in its own set. Okay? So if we look at the examples we have before, is Sn primitive when it's acting on 1 up to n? Yes because if you have some non-trivial partition, you can just, uh, where one of the bits is a size at least two, you can just swap one of those bits out with um, something else in the set, and then you'll be messing up your partition. However, uh, G or V is not primitive, because uh, it preserves um, the line through the origin, so scalar multiples of things that preserves a partition. Okay? So, we saw earlier that the finite primitive groups are classified by the Ogden Scott theorem, which I've got here, that uh, the finite primitive groups uh, belong to one of these five types here. Now, the ones I've got in red, the almost simple groups and the affine type groups are ones that I'll um, explore further in this talk. Okay, so Camilla earlier was talking about the diagonal type and the affine type, but I'll be focusing basically exclusively on these two. So let's look at the almost simple groups and bases there. So remember that we say that a group is almost simple if we can find a non-abelian finite simple group S such that G is between S and its automorphism group, okay? Now, um, I'm going to just further distinguish between two sorts of actions for transitive almost simple groups, um, which I are called standard and non-standard, okay? So if you've got an almost simple group that's transitive, um, then it's standard if either it's a classical group acting on an orbit of subspaces of its natural module, like roughly, there are a couple of extra cases here, but it's roughly this, um, or if the Sokol is the alternating group and you're acting on 
um, some set of case subsets or partitions of 1 up 10. So in these two circumstances, we say that the group is acting in a standard way. Otherwise, you guessed it, we call it a non-standard action, right? Now, this is the first of several cool results um, I'll show you. It's the following. So Vanessa et al. showed in a series of papers that if you've got a primitive, almost simple group in a non-standard action, then the base size is at most seven. And the reason why I think this result is rather re remarkable is because, you know, we have some small groups um, in this collection, but we also have some absolutely enormous groups. Okay, I think millions, billions, like very large um, sets, but we <coughs> always find at most seven points of our set, um, such that only the, the identity permutation fixes those seven points. Okay. All right, so that's some almost simple groups. Now let's talk about general upper bounds for all primitive groups. So we're going to make use of this sort of expression we had from the, for the lower bound before. And Peeber conjectured in 1993 that we should be able to find an absolute constant C such that the base size for a primitive permutation group of degree N is bounded above by C times that ratio of logs. Okay. Now this conjecture was open for roughly 25 years and um, was solved in many special cases by a variety of authors, but the proof was finished off in 2016 by Duyan Halassi Murati, who showed that actually an appropriate multiplicative constant here is 45, but they also had, an, had to add an additive constant C there. Okay. And this was a very exciting time for me personally, because 2016 is also when I started my PhD on bases um, for primitive groups. And so it was quite exciting that this long-standing open conjecture had been resolved. And in fact, during my first year, my supervisor, Martin Liebeck, came to me and said, OK, I'm working with Halassi and Marotti to try and improve this result, but we need this technical lemma, which is related to some stuff that you're doing. Can we set about trying to um, sort this out? So him and I co-authored a paper that was a key auxiliary result to the improvement um, that was published by Halassi, Liebeck and Marotti, where they dropped from a 45 here down to a 2, and they added the, they um, found that they had to add a 24 there. Okay. Now, they gave an example, which I'll show you a little bit later, that shows that the multiplicative constant of 2 here is optimal. Well, optimal at least if you want to have an integer there. Okay. But they do note that the 24 you could improve upon with significantly more work. Okay. All right. So that's a general upper bound for all primitive groups. But as we saw with those non-standard, almost simple groups from before, there are some families of groups where you can find an upper bound that's actually much smaller. And in fact, now we're going to talk about classifying primitive groups with very small bases. Okay? So one of the properties that you learn about when you first learn about primitive groups is that the point stabilizer is maximal um, in a primitive group. So if you've got a primitive group with base size 1, that means that the um, trivial group has to be maximal inside the primitive group. So the group has to be isomorphic to just a cyclic group of order p. So the smallest interesting base size is 2. And in the 90s, Jan Saxon proposed a program where we should go about classifying the primitive groups with base size equal to 2. Now, there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of results by myself and lots of other people before me um, and after me um, in this project. And so if you're interested in more than I talk about here, I invite you to check out Tom Lee's book, who is after me. Um, but I am just going to talk about my work with the affine type groups. So recall um, that for an affine type group, we've got a d-dimensional vector space over f cubed, some finite field. Um, v acts on itself by translations. General linear group acts by linear transformations, of course, and then we take the semi-direct product of these two things and we get the general affine group. Now, as Camilla mentioned in her talk, um, a subgroup of this general affine group is primitive if and only if the point stabilizer, which is the bit that is the linear transformations, acts irreducibly on the vector space. Okay, so that means that it doesn't preserve any um, non-trivial subspaces of, of your vector space. Okay, so those are the primitive groups that we're looking at. 
examples here. Well, first of all, if we take the whole general affine group, then the base size is the dimension of v plus 1. Because what do we do? Okay, well, we can we first fix a vector. Since the group is transitive, we can pick any vector. So I'm going to fix the zero vector. I get rid of all of my translations, and I just have the general linear group still acting. And in the beginning of my talk, we worked out that the base size of the general linear group was the dimension of v. Okay? And so this illustrates something that's quite cool for affine type groups, which is that really, if you're trying to work out the base size, it comes down to what the base size of that irreducible point stabilizer is. Because if you want to know the base size of the, the affine type group, you just have to act, add one to account for the translations. Okay? Now, here's that example that I mentioned from before, um, from the Halasi, Liebeck, and Marotti result. So if you take the symplectic group, sp2k of q, acting on its natural module, then it turns out that the base size here is equal to 2k. Right? And if we compare this to that ratio of logs which we had as a lower bound, that's roughly k. So phew, it's a lower bound, as we would expect. But if you were going to have some multiple of this be an upper bound, you would need a multiplicative constant of at least two. Okay, so that's how we know it's optimal. Okay. So um, as for classifying the groups of base size to um, the primitive affine type groups, there's been a big focus on this particular situation where the point stabilizer is a covering group of an almost simple group. So what the heck is that? Well, we know, we saw before what almost simple groups are. So now a covering group of an almost simple group is a group G such that we can find some subgroup Z. Oh. Okay. I'll go with it. <laughs> some subgroup Z, which is contained in the intersection of the center and the derived subgroup such that when we quotient out by that z, we get a group that's almost similar. Okay. So there's been a big focus there, and we know completely um, the groups with base size 2 when the socle of the almost simple group sitting underneath is either sporadic or alternating. Okay. And um, if you go through your classification of finite simple groups, you'll see that we have the groups of lead type left. And one case... Um, for these groups was finished way before these results. So in 2001 by Kohler and Parlings. So they were interested in groups of lead type where the size of your group of lead type and the size of the vector space you're acting on are co-prime. And the reason why they were interested in that specific case is because they were applying it to a famous conjecture called the KGV conjecture. And it turns out that uh, proving that um, these groups have a regular orbit, so the corresponding affine group has base size 2, um, prove the conjecture that they were looking for. Okay? So, uh, yep. So they showed that um, in all situations you have the corresponding affine type group having base size 2, or they can tell you exactly uh, which groups are left over, the ones that don't have base size 2. Except for the fact that last year, when one of my papers was being refereed, the referee pointed out that Kohler and Parling's actually missed a case in their analysis, which meant that I had to work it out. Mm -hmm. So um, I consulted Frank Lubeck, and he ended up facing that up to finish off this classification here. Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with the case where you've got um, H, the point stabilizer, being a group of Lie type. It's got some field underneath because it's a group of Lie types, um, and uh, the the group and the vector space that it's acting on um, are not, their orders are not co-prime. Okay, and this is where I come in. So, I'm going to wave my hands a bit here because there's a lot of uh, intense theory that, that went into this, which is essentially my PhD project. Now, the problem is, is that when these things are not co-prime, um, especially when the underlying fields of H and V uh, um, have different characteristics, we don't know a whole lot about the possible irreducible modules for our H's. In some situations, we only know what the smallest module looks like, and then a lower bound for the dimension of the next smallest module, right? Um, when the underlying fields do have the same characteristic, there's some really nice theory we can use um, with the algebraic groups, so the groups over infinite fields, that allow us to make a lot of headway, but still, like, the techniques are, are very um, intricate and somewhat tedious. But essentially, what we do 
is instead of like trying to explicitly construct a base um, for each of these groups, we instead use a sort of theoretical non-constructive technique where we say, uh, if this group doesn't have base size two, then some inequality must hold, and that inequality is related to elements of prime order in these groups and the sizes of their eigenspaces. Okay, so please come and talk to me more about it if you're interested, um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff behind this. So let me stop chatting about techniques and just show you the result. So again, we've got our primitive group of Lagrange type, point stabilizer is a covering group of an almost simple group of Lie type. In the situation where H and V do not have the same uh, fields of the same underlying characteristic, then I can tell you exactly what the base size is, right? So in my paper, the result is essentially either the base size is two or it's in one of these massive tables and I can tell you exactly what the base size is, okay? Now, when they do have the same underlying field characteristic, there's a lot of rich theory there, but you end up with these infinite families of groups with infinite families of module constructions where it's very hard to determine the base size. So here I was only able to look at the case where you mod out the center um, and take the sockle and you've got PSL and Q there. And there I can tell you that either the base size is equal to two or you've got some uh, infinite families there. And just for fun, I included one of my massive tables from this first thing here, just to give you an idea, um, which I'll show you in a sec. Either way, the corollary from these results is that the base size is at most five for the families um, that I've got here. So here's my table. <laughs> now, am I expecting you to be able to read this and get anything out of it right now? No, but the point is, it's all there. So if at any point in the future you would like to know what the base size of one of these groups are, you can go with that. All right, so that's enough about um, bases for permutation groups, just purely. Now we're going to move on to Ibis groups. So now I care about ordered bases, okay? So I have an ordered base, V1 up to Vt, and I say that it's irredundant if I have this chain of subgroups. So essentially, um, if I stabilize the first i points in my base, okay? then that stabilizer doesn't fix the next point. Okay, so there's kind of no redundancy there, which is kind of in the name, right? Now, we say that G is an irredundant basis of invariant size, or IBIS group, if, well, exactly what it sounds like, if all of its irredundant bases are of the same size. Okay. I suspect this name was given for the nice um, acronym. But these groups were introduced by Cameron and Fonderflas, who in 1995 showed something rather interesting, which is that if you have an IBIS group, then you also have these other nice things, namely that all irredundant bases for G are preserved by reordering. So if you have an irredundant base for your group, uh, any reordering of it, of it is still irredundant, which isn't clear um, just from the definition. And also, these irredundant bases are bases of a matroid. Okay, so there's some nice connections to another field of mathematics. So in their paper, Cameron and Van der Flas, uh, suggested that we classify IBIS groups. Now, not much progress was made in the past, you know, 25 years. And one of the reasons for that is Peter Cameron himself said that it seems very hard to classify these groups because if you've got two groups that you know to be IBIS, there's all sorts of ways you can combine them to make another IBIS group, okay? So they're, they're kind of wild in some sense. But he suggested that perhaps an easier problem, maybe easier, is to classify the primitive IBIS groups, okay? And so there was a paper last year by Lucchini, Morigi, and Moscatiello um, who showed that if you do have a primitive IBIS group, then one of the following holds. So the group has to be in one of these three Onan Scott types. Okay. And the paper was um, really cool because not only did they show this, but they said that if you do have um, an IBIS group that's of diagonal type, it has to belong to this family here, okay? So it's got to be isomorphic to the direct product of these two PSL2 to the VFs um, acting with this degree here, okay? So we've only got the almost simple groups and the affine type groups left to focus on. And they further have a lever, 
which was very interesting, which says that if you have a primitive ibis group with a non-abelian socle, so that means it's in any family apart from the affine type groups, and base size 2, then it cannot possibly be ibis. Okay? So for the almost simple groups, we only have to deal with those where we know that the base size is larger than 2. So I was reading this paper and I thought to myself, okay, this is, this is really cool, maybe I can work on this. In particular, I know that the almost simple primitive groups where you've got a sporadic or alternating suckle and the base size is strictly larger than 2 and right? So I can just look up those papers, have an explicit list of groups that I have to check, and try and like check to see whether each one of those are if I was. Okay. So this year, um, in the past couple of years, I've worked on this, and a couple of months ago, Pablo Spiga uploaded the arc to the archive the classification for groups with alternating cycle, right? Which I had also done, but was hoping to knock off the sporadic ones as well and publish them together. So I contacted him and we decided to publish our results together. So I'll, I've got it up there for you to have a look at while I have some water. So if you have an almost simple primitive ibis group where the sockle is alternating, then either it's a group in this infinite family here, so just that natural family where you've got the alternating or symmetric group acting on end points, or you've got one of these sort of like small examples here. Okay. Now, I spoke to Pablo about maybe working together on the sporadic groups, and he said, okay, well, I've got some other stuff going on, so you go ahead. I'm okay. And so I've been working on the sporadic groups, and I'm almost finished, okay? So what I'm about to show you is definitely work in progress, which is why I'm calling it a proposition, but hopefully next time I see you, it will be a theorem. So if you've got an almost simple primitive ibis group, uh, with sporadic sockle, and that sockle is not isomorphic to the baby monster, then it's one of the Matthew groups in their natural actions. Okay? Now, why am I having trouble specifically with the baby monster? Well, uh, the technique that I'm using requires knowing something about uh, the orbit sizes of the sporadic groups on cosets of their maximal subgroups, right? So the baby monster is really, really, really big, and the maximum subgroups I have left are pretty small, so the degree of the action is huge. And so I've been sitting there trying to work out how to enumerate the orbits of these things, but it's still a work in progress. Okay? All right. So that's what I'm working on at the moment, but there are still some other open problems um, related to IBIS groups. So of course we still need to complete the classification of almost simple primitive IBIS groups. So we've still got the groups of Lee type left, now, the problem there is that we don't actually know what all the groups with base size strictly larger than 2 are. Okay. So if you're hoping to classify the IBIS groups in this first thing here, you would need to somehow get around this. Like, you would need to somehow not have an explicit list, unless you can also solve uh, all the, find all the primitive groups in that situation with base size 2, which would be pretty remarkable in itself. And then again, we still have said nothing about the affine primitive ibis groups, where we can't use this nice result about the base size being strictly larger than 2. So it's still wide open. Okay. Prime graphs. So now onto something completely different. So I've got a finite group. It doesn't have to be primitive or anything. It's just a finite group. And I'm going to define a graph on it called the prime graph, or the Hegel graph, after the people that... Um, first proposed it, and this graph is going to have vertices, the primes dividing, the order of G, okay? And I'm going to connect two vertices by an edge, if and only if there's an element of order, the product of those two primes um, in the group. Okay. Let's see some examples. Well, first of all, if you've got a P group, of course you're going to just have one isolated vertex, because there's only one prime dividing the order of the group. If you've got the Matthew group M11, then this is the prime graph here. So I've got 2, 3, 5, 11, and I only connect 2 and 3, because there's an element of order 6 in there. And then similarly for PSL 231, I've got 2, 3, 5, 31, and I've just got one edge there. Now, one of the reasons that I've included these two examples is that here I really care about the labelling of the graph. 
okay? So I'm not actually considering these two graphs to be the same, right? Because the vertices are labeled differently, even though if they were unlabeled, they would be isomorphic. Now, there are all sorts of things you can ask about these graphs, but something that seems to be of particular interest recently has been recognizability of groups by prime graph. So we say that a finite group is recognizable by prime graph if it is the only group up to isomorphism with that prime graph. We say that it's k-recognizable for some finite k if there are exactly k groups um, up to isomorphism, the same prime graph. And as you might have guessed, we say that it's unrecognizable if there are infinitely many groups with the same prime graph. Okay? So let's check out our examples here. Well, of course, easily you can see that uh, p-groups are unrecognizable by prime graph, right? Because you can construct any p-group you like. Turns out M11 is too recognizable by prime graph. The only other group with the same prime graph is PSL211. And PSL231 is actually the only finite group with that prime graph. Okay, so there's a lot of variety there. All right. So here's a rather cool result from last year by Cameron and Maslova. They say that if you uh, have a group that's k recognizable by prime graph for some finite k, then that group has to be almost simple with non abelian circle. Okay? So this has some nice implications. So then we ask, okay, like, let's, let's look at all the almost simple groups and try and figure out whether the group is recognizable by prime graph. Um, but something nice that happens is that to prove it's unrecognizable, it's sufficient to just exhibit one group that's not almost simple that has the same prime graph. Okay? All right. So, as us group theorists, or well, at least group theorists in my area like to do, we just go through the classification and see what the deal is for each of those groups. So, let's start with the sporadic groups. So, Hagee in 2003 had a really nice paper where they classify um, uh, a bunch of the sporadic groups by prime graph according to recognizability and it's kind of um, a very instructive paper in that it um, shows it has lots of nice applications of the techniques that are commonly used to prove this sort of thing so basically um, with these sporadic groups you've got one group you know what its prime graph looks like you know the primes that divide the order of the group so then you can just do some number theoretic argument to say, okay, the composition factors of any group with the same prime graph have to look like this, and then you can make some additional arguments to prove the recognizability. Okay, so that was a very nice paper. Um, so Van Itzien extended these results in 2006 by showing that uh, J4 is recognizable by prime graph. Then there was nothing for like over 10 years, and then Kondratiev came along and just finished up the majority of the other sporadic groups. And Kondratiev had uh, a very nice observation that allowed him to knock most of these off very easily. And he noticed that for most of the remaining groups, uh, Hagee had found that if you had a group with the same prime graph, it would have to look like um, one of the, these sporadic groups with some soluble bit tacked on, like so a whole bunch of p groups. And Kondratiev noted that actually um, it turns out that these sporadic groups, if you had like a soluble bit tacked on, then these sporadic groups would have to act irreducibly on some subgroup or quotient of it. Okay? Um, so I'm waving my hands a bit here, but it's a very nice construction. So again, it reduces down to some uh, representation theory problem. And um, it becomes about um, whether, group, uh, whether group elements of certain orders have fixed points uh, in these representations. Okay? So what Kondratiev did is he just looked in the atlas, looked up the character tables of these groups, like just by inspection looked down and went, nope, no fixed points, okay, I know what the answer is, that sort of thing. Now, if you're super into sporadic groups uh, and you haven't been listening to what I'm saying, you'll Note that there are three groups that are missing from this analysis here, and that those are Conway 1, Baby Monster, and the Monster Group. Okay? And the reason why Kondrato didn't deal with those is because we don't actually know all the modular character tables for those groups because they're so big. Right? So, 
last year we had a um, research group retreat. Uh, beautiful Waikiki Island wine region, fantastic couple of days. And we, uh, a bunch of people posed problems to work on um, in, this, in this retreat. And one of them was proposed by my collaborator, Tobosh Popiel, which was to finish off the classification for those three groups. And him and I managed to finish it off last year. And we showed that those three groups are recognizable by prime graph. And we essentially used the same techniques as Kondratiev. But since we don't know the modular character tables for these groups, we instead have to like drop down like several levels of subgroups to some smaller groups and try and deduce what the the character table of of these groups are. Okay, so it was quite fiddly work, but I was pleased we were able to finish it off there. Right. So that's the sporadic groups. What about other families of groups? Well, for the Lee type groups, there's been lots and lots and lots of papers making progress. So I've got some of the results up here. So we do have answers for some families of groups. Um, but as we know, for many of the families of the groups of Lee type, we have kind of like, it's an infinite family in, in two directions. Maybe we'll infinite in the field and infinite in dimension. And as you can see here, um, a lot of the results only deal with like infinite families in one of these directions. So it's still wide open in a bunch of these cases. And in fact, regularly there are papers on the archive where someone just works out for one single group whether it's recognizable by prime graph or not. Okay. So there's heaps and heaps here if you care to work on it. As for the groups uh, with alternating suckle, again, there's heaps and heaps of results. One of the more recent results is by Goshkov et al, who show that if you have a group with the same prime graph as either the alternating or symmetric group with n at least 19, then uh, you can find a normal subgroup k such that when you quotient out by this k here, you're, contain you're either an alternating or symmetric group. Okay? And there's some restriction on, on the devices. Um, of the size of k there. Okay. So after our success with the sporadic groups, I got all excited and thought, maybe I can finish off the alternating and symmetric groups. And I'm almost there, but I'm very stuck and have been stuck for, for some time. So I'll show you what I've got in case anyone has any brilliant ideas. Here's what I've got. I can prove pretty easily that the symmetric group is unrecognizable by prime graph. Okay? And this is using... Um, Similar techniques to Kondratiev, in that I'm looking at irreducible representations of the symmetric group, but I'm actually also leveraging Cameron and Maslova because I can just show you a, a group that's not almost simple, but it has the same prime graph, therefore there are infinitely many. Okay? Similarly, for the alternating group, I can basically do the same thing, and I find that almost all of them are unrecognizable by prime graph, except for possibly the groups in the, with the following two conditions, either n and n minus two are both prime, or n minus one and n minus three are both prime, right? So these are kind of funny conditions, and in order to finish these off, it would be sufficient to know some things about um, whether the elements of these orders have fixed points in their irreducible representations, okay? So if anyone has some ideas about that, I would appreciate it a lot. Okay. So here's some other open problems in this area. So I've talked a lot about recognizability by prime graph, but there are lots of other things you can ask. For example, which finite graphs can be realized as a prime graph for some finite group G? Okay. So last summer I had a, last southern hemisphere summer, I had a, a student, a vacation student, who worked on this for some uh, small primitive groups. And he found that um, basically, all of the small number, of, uh, all of the graphs on a small number of vertices can be realized as a prime graph for some uh, finite group. So that was cool, but we're no closer to knowing what the answer is in general. And also, I find this question here very intriguing. What is the maximum number of almost simple groups which have the same prime graph? Okay, so we know that if there are finitely many groups with the same prime graph, they, then they must all be almost simple, but we don't know how many, like what's the maximum number you can have that all have the same prime graph, okay? And of course, this is only one example of 
a graph that you can define on a group. There are heaps and heaps and heaps of others. Uh, for example, Peter Cameron um, in recent years has written a lot of papers with a lot of co-authors in the Graphs on Groups project where they've got all sorts of different graphs and can show all, so all sorts of properties. And also I've got a little plug here for mm -hmm. Sol's talk and Scott's talk where they talk about some other graphs that you can define on groups. Okay. Uh, let's finish off now by talking about extremely primitive groups. Okay. All right. So here I've got a finite non-regular primitive permutation group. Okay. And I call it extremely primitive if a point stabilizer acts primitively on each of its orbits. That's not the point you're fixing. Okay. Now, these groups have been of interest... Um, since work of Manning in the 1920s. And in 2007, Mann, Prager, and Scherer showed that if you've got a group that's extremely primitive, then it has to be of affine type or almost simple type. So again, we have these two families of primitive groups. Yeah. And then Benes, Prager, and Scherer in 2012, and then Benes and Thomas in 2021, uh, showed that if you've got an extremely primitive, almost simple group, uh, then it belongs to one of five infinite families or is one of 21 further examples. Okay, so these first authors classified all of those except for the exceptional ones, I think, and then Benes and Thomas finished it off. So I've got them here for your convenience. So as you can see here, we've got um, a couple of infinite families for the alternating groups, um, PSL to Q and symplectic group there. And then we've got a whole bunch of sort of sporadic examples. Okay. So the almost simple ones are completely done. What about the affine type ones? Well, Mann, Prager, and Sherish um, had a nice result in their paper where they first um, talked about these groups that said that if you've got an extremely primitive affine type group, then either you've got a, um, a point stabilizer being soluble, the point stabilizer is too transitive, and we can tell you exactly what it is, or uh, the vector space that you're acting on uh, has characteristic two, and the point stabilizer is almost simple. Okay. Now, they weren't quite able to finish off the classification in the, this third thing here, but they did go the extra mile. They said, okay, well, we can't quite finish it off, but if we're allowed to assume this extra famous conjecture in the area called Wall's conjecture, then we know that this part three reduces to a list S of three infinite families and 16 further possibilities that could be um, extremely primitive, right? So they didn't say that these are definitely extremely primitive, but this is sort of like the list of possible candidates. Now, unfortunately for them, it turns out that Wall's conjecture is false. So that sucks. Um, and nevertheless, Vanessa and Thomas showed that no group in this um, list S here is extremely primitive. Okay. So in some ways we're kind of back to square one with this, with this bit here. Okay. Um, then in 2021, so last year, <coughs> Vanessa contacted me and said, I'd really like to finish this off. We've, I've done all this work with Adam Thomas, try and finish this off. And I have a good idea. And the good idea was the following, that if you've got uh, an affine type group, the point stabilizer is almost simple, and that almost simple group has a regular orbit, so it's got an orbit that's the size of the group, then you can't have this group being extremely primitive. And the reason for that is that my H is supposed to be acting primitively on its orbits, but if it has a regular orbit, and it's primitive, that means that the trivial group has to be maximal, so this H has to be cyclic of order P, which is a contradiction. Okay. Now, I knew a lot about this because this is essentially like, you know, H has a regular orbit if and only if this group G has base size 2. Okay. So together we finished off this classification and showed that there are no further insoluble extremely primitive groups. Now, if you're the one or two people in the audience that have seen me give this talk previously, you'll notice the extra inclusion of this word insoluble here, which I didn't have last time. And let me tell you why. So a couple of months ago, 
this is hot off the press, a uh, paper came across my desk about uh, classifying linear spaces that admit an extremely primitive group of point automorphisms. Okay? So you don't need to know what a linear space is or anything like that. Um, but I was interested in extending the results of this paper and thought it would be a good project for myself and my um, colleague, Gabrielle Verre, to work on together. Now, Gabrielle um, didn't know anything about the classification of extremely primitive groups, and so he sat down for a couple of days to work through it, and he came to me and he said, I'm not sure I understand this proof for the soluble case. I said, okay, so we sat down and we went through it together, and it turns out that the conditions um, that were given for extremely primitive soluble groups were necessary but not sufficient. Okay. So, in order to deal with this problem, we first had to finish off the classification here. So, here's the classification. This is like one month old or something. So, here's the setup. Uh, you've, again, we've got this um, group of affine type. The point stabilizer is not trivial, and we want it to be extremely primitive. Then it has to look like this. Okay, so you've got a cyclic group of order Q extended by a cyclic group of order E. Okay. And we've got the following conditions. So you've got Q being a primitive prime divisor of P to the D minus 1. Okay. Um, and E is a prime dividing D because it's acting as field automorphisms. So these are the conditions that were in the original paper by Mann, Prager, and Sherish. But it turns out that in order for such a group to be extremely primitive, you also need um, either E to be equal to 1, or you need E to be at least two, and then I can tell you exactly what that primitive prime divisor needs to be. Okay, so now we're happy that the classification of extremely primitive groups is finished, and we can move on with our original aim. All right, that's all I wanted to say, thanks.